Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, our weekly discussion of what's happening in the world of the Beatles. As I said, I'm Steve Marinucci, the uh, Beatles Examiner columnist and many other Examiner columnists on Examiner.com. And with me is my my co-host across the country and, no, not across the world, but anyway, um, my co-host, the very distinguished Mr. Ken Michael. Hello, Ken. Uh, hi, Steve. I'm <laughs> I surprise dis- dis- you. I surprise you every time I do that, don't I? You never know what I'm going to come up with. No, no, you're a wild man. That's right. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> let's, we, not go th- let's not go there. And, and, um, and we are we are across the world. That's true. We are actually. Okay. Well, we're at least across the country. Today, we're going to talk about uh, an experience one of us had, and that was Ken. He went to see Paul McCartney in Albany uh, over the weekend, and we're going to discuss that, what it was like, uh, how he looked. He got to see the first American show, and Ken, first of all, I guess the, the, the best question is, what was the reaction? That was one thing that I kept asking people on Facebook. What was the reaction like? What was it like when he walked out on stage? I think it was a bit crazy. I mean, everybody <laughs> cheered him on. Why, why is that funny? No, I'm, I'm not laughing. I'm not. I don't think it's funny. I just think it. it I, you know, I expected that people would go pretty solidly nuts because, you know, because he'd, he'd been away so long. Mm-hmm. And well, a lot depends upon where you were sitting. I know that people who were on the floor throughout most of the show they were standing and they mm-hmm. were really into the show. Where I was sitting, which was sort of on the the mid level. And at, um, I guess it would be 3 o'clock from the stage, I was in a very tame area (laughs) of the Times Union Center. I was one of the few people, along with my family, that stood up uh, after certain songs. Everybody was sitting down in my area. Mm -hmm. But everybody was, at the very least, extremely respectful of Paul. I mean, um, you know, he got a great reaction with all of his music, including the new songs. So... uh, which we will discuss. Yeah, but I, I mean, because I figured, you know, maybe I'm uh, trying to, trying to make too much out of it. I figured the place would have gone nuts, you know, after what had happened, after, you know, everybody, you know, all the rumors and everything. I mean, just of seeing him on stage. I mean, I thought I would have thought everybody would have, would have gone crazy. Well, I think that they did go a bit crazy. Okay. You know, I don't. I don't think it was pandemonium. Okay. But I mean that they were pleased to see him. They were curious to know what he would look like after what he's been through. You know, you saw him on on stage for the first time. He looked great. He seemed really pumped up to do this show. And um, all in all, I think it's one of the most impressive shows I've ever seen in my life, to tell you the truth, for a, a number of reasons. Did he make any reference to being back and, you know, how good it was to be on stage again? Did he stick to the usual script? Pretty much to the same script. He didn't say anything about his virus. He didn't say anything about being ill. No reference whatsoever to that. Okay. You know, the usual, are you ready to have a good time? Are you ready to rock tonight? And there were several times that he would look into the audience and he was just kind of beaming that people just loved him, you know, and he felt the love. And I just think that he's so appreciative of that. And it may, he, it may sound corny to say this, but I do really think that because he sees that it's a packed house. He sees sure. people, you know, are looking forward so much to this. And um, he put on an amazing show. I mean, he always, anytime, you know, I mean, I don't know if you want to call it part of the stage act or whatever, but he always has this very earnest, you know, um, very appreciative look. Uh, and, you know, there's the, you know, let me soak this in thing, you know, he does that little stick. And I mean, mm-hmm. there's just so many, there's so many things that whether or not they're part of the, the show, you know, I mean, there is, you do feel that not all of it is, is part of the show. I mean, you do feel that he, there's a genuine respect and, you know, and love for the audience, especially, you know, when he does things like pull people out of the, the audience, like we're, we'll talk about them. Mm-hmm. You know, that kind of thing, too. I mean, that, uh, you know, not every performer, performer does that type of stuff. So, Well, know. so much of what he said, uh, you know, are anecdotes or stories that, or certain lines that he's used many times over. But there are times when I felt like he did ad-lib a little bit. Mm-hmm. There are times when he's in the moment. 
But he does the usual thing, like he'll point to certain sections of the arena, and you know, how are you in the back? How are you on this side? Just to acknowledge all the different sections and different areas, and he gets a great response from that. Right. You know, it's just him acknowledging that the people are there. And um, no, it, it, there's, there's so many wonderful things to talk about with this show. And I was uh, surprised myself. You know, I really shouldn't be surprised. I'm surprised and I'm not surprised because okay. he's done this so many times before. He's wowed me with the two and a half hour shows. And but the whole thing is it, the fact that it came. This happened after his virus. Mm-hmm. And we even question here on the show, is it possible that he might just scale it back a little bit? Right. We did take, take it a little easy. Nobody would find fault with him if he was to do that, if the show was 15 minutes less or half an hour less. Instead, instead of doing a two and a half hour show, he did a three hour show. Yeah, he, had, he actually added a song, which, you know, which was amazing in its own, you know. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the biggest highlights for me was that, the fact that he did On My Way to Work. And when he introduced it, he said, this is a song from the new album we haven't done live yet before, and I'm just <laughs> I'm just bubbling when I'm hearing that, not knowing what it would be, but anything that's different is a thrill for me. Which one were you hoping for? Were you hoping for, was that the one you were hoping for? Or would you, was there one in particular you, were, you, you would have really, really gone? Well, to tell you the truth, you know I love I Can Bet. You know, I'd love to hear him do that live. But I was thinking only because there's a brand new video for early days. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking maybe he might do that one. But then right. again, he made a video for Appreciate, and he hasn't done that. Right. So I wasn't sure. But I'd be happy to hear anything new. I, I did see that during his sound check, he was rehearsing Alligator. Okay. So I would have loved to have heard that. But anything... You know, I love the fact that he's doing the four songs that he's been doing since the start of the Out There tour. And I also thought once he did On My Way to Work, I was thinking to myself, is he going to take out one of the other songs from New to replace it? But I was pleased to see that he didn't. He did five songs from New. Right. Did you, you know? see, did he show the, or did they show the Appreciate video before the show started? I got to sit down about ten minutes before the show started, so I didn't see everything. Okay. But, um, no, I think most of all, I was impressed by the fact that, yes, he gave you a three-hour show. And that's with the addition of taking the time out for the encores and also inviting the two people that we're about to talk about on stage. But even still, usually whenever I've counted the number of songs that he does in concert, it, it tends to be around 35. Right. And that includes the medley of Golden Slumbers Carry That Way at the End, which I count as one. Okay. And this time he did 38. So just the fact that he did any more than he normally does, that surprised me. You know, I just, I can't believe that he has the strength to do this. And maybe it's the, maybe it's the fact that he's had some time to rest. Maybe yeah. that helped him. But then you can't help but wonder, he, he was hurting there for a while, for several weeks with this virus. And the, th- and the thing, too, is that every song in that set, he sings. It's not like, he ha- he doesn't hand it off to... I mean, the other guys may join in, but he's on them all. He's oh, I on know. Every, every one of those songs, which is... It's been pretty... that way since after Wings. Right, <laughs> For right. For the most part. I mean, uh, I remember in 93 when Robbie McIntosh did an instrumental of his own. Mm-hmm. You know, you have something like that, but after Wings, it's been Paul doing all the lead vocals. And, I mean, not to not to put Ringo down or anything, but Ringo doesn't do every song. You know, Ringo does, Ringo does what, maybe a third, uh, a third of the songs, maybe. Oh um, yeah, he also does the shortest ones. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but he does about a dozen songs in concert. But he does what's right for him in that format, right. and it works perfectly. Right. But well, um, hey, what can we say? Anyway, let's talk about on my way to work. You, you touched on it briefly. How did it sound? It sounded like the record. Did it really? <laughs> Truthfully, yeah. And and um, I will say, and, and this is not cutting Paul down in any way, it's one of the easiest songs to sing because it's in a lower register. Mm-hmm. So it's not as demanding as other songs might be. No, I thought it sounded so much like the record. Very close to it. His voice sounded just like what it was on the studio recording. And I was curious to, to see, because I know he didn't do the song in Pittsburgh, 
He's playing tonight as we're recording this in Chicago. I don't know if he did it there. So I don't know if this is going to be a song that he will sneak in to his set list. Because, as we've said here on this show, there is a certain format to Paul's concerts. Mm -hmm. There are A-list songs that he will do no matter what. The Hey Judes, Let It Be, Band on the Run, Live and Let Die, certain songs like that. And then there are the C songs, which are usually the newest songs. And then there's the B ones, which... The B ones can be, in some ways, very interesting because they're interchangeable. That's when he'll do two shows in a row and he won't do the exact same set list. He'll alternate one song for another. He'll do I've Just Seen a Face one night and then the next night he'll do I'm Looking Through You. Or he'll, he'll do And I Love Her. There are certain songs that you know he doesn't do in every single show. Mm -hmm. Some shows he does Get Back. Some shows he does I Saw Her Standing There in its place. There are songs like that. And for most people, a lot of those songs would be A-level. <laughs> but for right. Paul, those are the B's. So, um, you know, that's what kind of makes his shows interesting. And um, like, for example, in my show, he did And I Love Her. And most of the shows that I've seen Paul perform, I haven't seen him do And I Love Her. Certain I, I, I do like when he does that. Another one that I like that he doesn't do very often anymore is um, Till There Was You. Uh, I really, really, really like that. Well, he only did that in the one tour. He only did that in the 2005 tour, the one... Right, uh, right. Where the I, I, but, I, but that's one song that I think worked out really, really, really well. I And I, I'm i sorry he doesn't do that more often. I don't know if it has anything to do with the fact that he didn't write it or what, but I, I loved the fact that he actually did that on stage. I remember watching the video... You know, uh, several times watching the the Blu-ray because that's on the, the that's the one that's on the Blu-ray. That's a Blu-ray, and uh, boy, that uh, that song just sounds great. Uh huh. Anyway, um, well, I could also say that getting better when he did that in the the back in the U.S. tour, mm -hmm. that sounded fantastic, and he hasn't done that song since. Yeah. You know, there are certain songs I can't believe he'll only do well, on one tour. But then again, he's got such a backlog anyway. I was but. I was expecting that there would be a few more changes. Maybe not a ton, but at least a couple. And I was surprised that they didn't, you know, that all they did was On My Way to Work. And I was also surprised that the following show in um, the, the the next show... Pittsburgh. They took, yeah, they took On My Way to Work out. Well, that's what I'm saying. We have to wait and see if this is going to be a song that he alternates. Right. It'll be interesting to see what he does tonight. Um, so, But also, what I also found interesting is what he took out of the show. Mm -hmm. And immediately I noticed that he didn't do Your Mother Should Know. Right. That was taken out. And I'm sorry to say this, Steve, because this is a big highlight for you. Mm -hmm. He didn't do Mrs. Vanderbilt. That's true. He did not. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't... Uh... Well, I you know I compared it to San Jose, Costa Rica, when I wrote it up, and the only change was on my way to work. But you're right, yeah. I mean, those are two songs. The Mrs. Vanderbilt, I, you know, sounds so good, and I'm really surprised that he did not hmm. do that. But you know, who knows? I'm sure that'll come back eventually. But for me, the two things that I enjoyed most about the show was his energy level. He seemed really pumped up, and the other thing was his voice. And I do spend a lot of time listening for his voice because I treasure that voice, as our listeners well know. Right. And kind of similar to what I said before in previous shows, my only problem in, in any of the shows that I've seen in recent years is that the loud numbers, sometimes his voice is drowned out in the mix. And that bothers me a lot. Yeah. You will hear him sing front and center as clear as a bell when he does the softer songs when he does the acoustic songs, and that's when you can really tell, you know, how strong his vocals are. And for me, those were really special moments in particular with this show, especially with And I Love Her, which sounded great, Blackbird, which sounded great. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, for Blackbird and also for Here Today, which he does back-to-back, -back, he was on a riser. It was just hmm. him alone with his acoustic guitar, and the band wasn't even in sight. So it was like... You know, a very intimate moment there. So uh, that was really nice. And his voice is, is 
the best I've heard him sing in a long time. I think his voice was much better in this show than when I saw him last year at Barclays in Brooklyn. And especially on the acoustic numbers. For yesterday, I thought he sounded great. Another day, he was phenomenal. It's one of the, my favorite moments in the, sh- in the show. Uh, we can work it out. The acoustic songs, I think, really worked out well in this particular show. That may have, you know, a lot of that may have been the fact that he, you know, he had such a long rest. Although, yeah, well, we we just said that. But then again, you know, it could work against you if you're sick for quite a while, and then you gotta, you know, somehow get better and and uh, be strong enough to do this. And and like we said, this is this is a very demanding thing to do for anybody at any age. Right. So uh three hour show. I just couldn't believe that he put on a three hour show right yeah. after this, his first show back. So um the band sounded great. It's 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 a lot of fun to watch Abe Laboreal Jr. on the drums because he's so animated and he's so into it. And there are mm-hmm. certain songs when you watch him on the screen especially, like Let Me Roll It. I mean, his drumming on there, he is just his face is lit up and he's just a powerhouse on the drums at times. And and Speaking of Paul's voice, I think that he's really, and I shouldn't say this like it's anything new, I think he really knows how to control it. He knows when to belt out his voice, when he can hit certain notes, and when he can't. So he knows when to hold back, when it's not as strong. And I admire that a lot about him. There are times, especially on songs that are really vocally demanding, a song like Maybe I'm Amazed, which is a very tough song to sing. And he can't really... Uh, scream as loud as he used to, right? but he will substitute some high notes with falsetto notes, and that takes a skill, too, to be able to sing falsetto notes in tune, right on key, and there are times throughout the show, maybe I'm amazed was one particular uh, moment, but there were a few other songs when he was singing some really high notes in falsetto, and I was like turning to my wife, saying, did you hear that? Mm-hmm. You know, you never heard him sing that high. But bear in mind, it is falsetto. But again, there is a skill to singing falsetto and to do it with control. They, so, you know, he. There have been times when his voice has really kind of, you know, you can tell his voice sounds really ragged. Uh, and I have to admit, I have not. I had not pulled up any of the videos from Albany to to even look at them to hear how he sounded. But you're saying that that was not the case here. That he sounded, he sounded very good. He sounded very good, yes. I'm not going to say he's perfect, but I think that he was really the best that he could be, and I think that it was very strong. And you got to measure it not so much compared to when he sounded, what he sounded like in the Beatles or in the Wings days, but as someone who's now 72 years old. And yeah. for someone that age, he sounds really good. Really? <laughs> Compare that to other people his age. Yeah. That would be a, a, a much fair judgment. That's how mm-hmm. I look at it. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think he sounded great. I really did. And certain songs that I saw him do last year at the start of this tour, I think they sounded even better. I especially love being for the benefit of Mr. Kite and hearing Paul play that, that bass line. That's a real treat for me. Um, also, the fact that when he started doing this tour, it was definitely a big thrill for me that he brought back some of the wing songs, like Listen to What the Man Said. And most of all, High, 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 which is a great rock song, and the band really rocks with that one, and it belongs in the set, and it should be one of those songs that he always does. Mm -hmm. I mean, High, High, High works so well. You know, the pacing of the show, a big surprise to me, and he hasn't done this since um, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, but he did New, and then he did Queenie Eye back to back. He did two songs in a row from the new album, which I wasn't expecting him to do. I don't think he did that when I saw him last year. I'd have to double check on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, Paul usually spaces the songs apart because it's not really a good idea for people who, if people are ever going to leave the venue there to go for a bathroom break, they're going to go during a song that they don't know. Right. And I remember uh, in 2005 when Chaos and Creation in the Backyard came out, Paul made the announcement, the next couple of songs I'm going to do are from my new album. You shouldn't say that because <laughs> you're giving people an excuse to leave if they're not going to care about the new music. Right. It should be one song from a new from the newest album and then go back to something that everybody knows. But um, the fact that he did two songs in a row from new, you know, that kind of surprised me. And then he, he actually kind of bunched them up because three songs, 
four songs later, he did everybody out there. So, I mean, it wasn't too long. In that one little stretch of of, of uh, program, uh, he basically, you know, he did, you know, a good part of the album. Right. All together, so... And the fact that, as we've said many times, you got to realize a lot of people are seeing him for the first time. And as much as I've belly ached on this show, and I might still continue to do that when it comes to the tributes to John and George, which he hasn't changed in uh, since 2002 mm-hmm. <laughs> with Here Today and something, it still is an emotional moment in concert. And people are still screaming for John and screaming for George every time Paul says, let's hear it for John, let's hear it for George. Right. And uh, especially the visuals for George, lots of photos. Uh, those photos from the are, days. those photos are, are, are those are hard hard tugger, tuggers, as I should as to to put it mildly. That that they are. They mm-hmm. really are. Yeah. So. And also I noticed and this is the first time I think he I recall him doing this, but he made reference to the to the fact that the stories that he tells people have heard before. You know, he'll say, I know some of you have heard this, especially if you've been to my shows before. Mm. And then, you know, he said that twice (laughs) in Mm -hmm. the concert. So he's realizing, you know, he's repeating himself. But still, some of those stories a lot of people haven't heard. Mm -hmm. He talks about um, when the band played in Russia. And he was told by some of the, uh, the government officials there that he met that, the first song they ever heard or, or the first record they ever bought was Love Me Do and that they were brought up the way they learned English was through Beatle records. Right. It's a funny moment on stage when, when he imitates, you know, in a Russian voice. But um, there are some really nice moments like that. And if you haven't heard Paul say it many times over, you know, those people are thrilled. And as I've said many times, one of the great thrills is watching the reaction in the audience, especially with younger people. Right. And seeing younger people go to the shows and wearing Beatles shirts or wearing McCartney shirts. That's always it's always uh, a lot of fun. How I probably don't even have to ask this question. But uh how did the band uh how the band look? I know you've mentioned Abe already. How about uh Brian and and Rusty? Like and they Paul. always do. <laughs> <laughs> the band is great. I, yeah. I really I you know, I think these are fine musicians. They're a well-oiled machine. They've been doing these songs over and over. You know, it would be a real treat if you go back to all the songs that this band has been doing since 2002. It wouldn't be a stretch for them to reach back and do songs that they haven't done for quite a while. Mm -hmm. They have quite a repertoire of songs that they've done already, many of which they haven't done for quite a while. So would would it be that difficult to bring back Getting Better? Would it be that difficult to bring back, um... Uh, fixing a Hole. Actually, Fixing a Hole, Paul did just on piano in 2005. Right. But there are certain songs, like you said, Till There Was You. He did Please Please Me in that 2005 tour, and I'll Get You, and certain songs like that that he hasn't done since. Too Many People. Too Many People, you know he did that as a medley with She Came In Through the Bathroom Window. I mean, right. bring that back. It, it wouldn't take that long for the band to, to rehearse it and, and nail it. And, you know, a frustrating thing for so many of us who who read your columns and they get to see the songs that he did during the rehearsals. You know, there's a lot of songs there that you wish he would do as part of his show. I don't, uh, you know, that'll never happen. I think the the rehearsal things are are psychological for the the band, too. It's kind of a stretch out, you know. And I think there are songs that he does during those rehearsals that, you know, you'll never see him do on stage. A whole lot of shaking going on, for example. Maybe maybe not the 50s stuff, but his own originals. Right, yeah. You know, it would be great, for example, I think, if he decided to do Long Tall Sally. I was listening to the Hamburg tapes today, and there's a dynamite version of that song on there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely incredible version that they do at breakneck pace. And it would be fun to see if the band would do that. They probably wouldn't at this point, you know, because they just don't do anything that crazy i mean even when they do helter skelter they kind of keep the tempo down a little bit but it'd be fun to see something like that but who knows put that on my wish list okay i don't think helter skelter is is uh any any slower than the beatles no. version. well i mean they don't long tall sally on the hamburg tapes is sped, is sped up from what the beatles version was so because uh they really kind of take it through 
uh, at kind of a breakneck pace. But that's neither here nor there. Hmm. It's just the idea of them, you know, picking up some songs like that. It'd be fun to see that happen. Right. If it happens, you know, who knows? Uh, I mean, we don't know. Uh, supposedly, they're always looking at stuff to add. Mm -hmm. And whether they will or not, we don't, you know, we never know. So uh, uh, You never know. You never yeah. know with him. He might he might want to add new stuff just to, to shake up the show and make it interesting. Shake up the he, musicians. <laughs> so. I'll tell you one other thing, and I'm, I have to make sure I bring this up because when we were talking about Ringo's tour, we made mention of the fact that you couldn't buy his CDs mm -hmm. at his shows. You know, Ringo 2012 or a Greatest Hits. I looked at the merchandise that was on sale in Albany. There were no CDs of Paul's there. It was all T-shirts. They had a hoodie. They had uh, keychains, a tote bag, you know, but nothing from the music. Here's someone that just did five songs from the new album, and if anyone was interested and wanted to buy it after the show, it wasn't there. Right. And now I don't know if he's still do if it's still happening, but I know yeah. that. Brian had his CD there. Did Brian? Uh, did Rusty and Brian uh, and Abe have their CDs? I didn't see any CDs at all. Okay. Now I only went to one concession stand, but okay. um, I I only saw mainly T-shirts, and uh, it, it, maybe it's because there's more money to be made in that. I don't know, but maybe. Uh, it, it's shocking. I mean, here he is. He's promoting the new CD. You've got the new logo behind the band up on the stage and lights. And you can't even buy the CD there. Mm. Anyway, so you wanted to talk about that uh, couple that went on stage. Yeah, um, as they, as everybody who has read the stories by now knows, there was a couple who uh, Paul called up on stage. He saw their sign, and and they proposed on stage. Mm -hmm. Now, did you? Was this? Um, I, I can't remember if this was during the show, or it was during the sound check. I guess it was during the show, no, right? It was. It was towards the end of the show. Tor towards the end of the show. Yeah. And he saw their sign. Yeah one one of the signs said, "He won't marry me until he meets you," and the other sign that that uh, he he had uh, holding up read, "I've got the ring. I'm 64." So word got out to Paul, or Paul spotted in the audience, and he invited them up onto the stage and um the guy sang a verse of when i'm 64 with the band backing him up and paul was playing bass i could hear some bass notes there and um and then he got down on his knee and he proposed to her and she said yes well i have talked to i have contacted the people that uh, i interviewed them the story hasn't been written yet i'm in the process of doing it the the couple said that uh, it was something they actually thought of a couple of years ago. Uh, they got the idea in 2011. Uh -huh. They went to see him in Cincinnati. And he said he said they were just completely floored. I mean, it was it was like a dream it was a dream come true and they couldn't believe it. Who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't be? <laughs> but he says he was utterly calm on stage. Uh his name is John Dan, D A N N. John uh, that's and uh and her name is Claudia. Claudia Rogers uh -huh. is her name. And um, so, yeah, it was it was it was fantastic. It was uh, fantastic. That that was a great moment. I mean, there there's been so many of these great little moments. You know, I mean, Paul has no idea what's going to happen when when these people come up on stage. But I mean, there there's been just been great moments like this. You know, mm -hmm. this is another one. This is another one. And it got a lot. What what was funny was, it got a lot of coverage. It got picked up by a lot of newspapers. Uh, right. So, I'm sure Paul recognizes, or his people recognizes, a great story. And just like um, when he was in South America and he had that attack there with grasshoppers coming on stage, <laughs> he right. got a little bit of mileage out of that. Right. When he signed uh, um, someone's tattoo. A woman's tattoo at one of the concerts uh, on her back, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's great publicity right there. Yep. But um, I'm just so pleased that right after the show in Albany, online, there was all these glowing reviews of it. Everybody couldn't say enough about how great Paul was. Right. So um, getting all this good press 
seeing that, you know, people in the world and in the media are concerned about him after coming off this virus and uh, and, and pulling out all the stops and doing an incredible show like he did. I just have so much more admiration, if that's even possible, for this man to, to do something like this. You know, he really wants to give you his all. And, um, you know, I think I, I mentioned this before on the show. And believe me, I hope I'm 1,000% wrong in saying this. But it's just my opinion that ever since he got into this habit of doing two-and-a-half-hour shows since the Wings Over America days, I think he probably would be very disappointed if he couldn't give people that much. And I don't know if he would continue touring if he had to scale it back. And he's very mm-hmm. proud of the fact that he, he gives you so much. And I certainly was not, by any stretch of the imagination, expecting a three-hour show. I thought it would be pretty much the exact same show, two and a half hours, that's it. But the fact that he gave you another half hour, <laughs> it's just incredible. I just don't know how he how he has the strength, and he must he's got to be made of iron. I I, I just don't get it. Hmm. And I do remember, like after after the concert, I spotted a friend of mine that lives in Connecticut, and I didn't know she was there. And all I said was, all I said to her was, "So what do you think?" And she just shook her head in disbelief. She just couldn't believe that Paul could do this. How many people his age can do what he just did? It's truly amazing. It really is. Yep. Yep. It really, it really, really is. It's just. But uh, you know, I was just so pleased. In some ways, as much as I'd like to see so many changes in his set list, the fact that he did this, you know, and, and he pulled it off, that is in and of itself so amazing. And um, just hope he keeps on continuing to do more shows like this. And like we just heard today, as we're doing this show, he added a show in, in San Diego. And, and that, that's really that's really big because he hasn't played there since the, the 70s. Since Wings. Since Wings, since yeah. I know a couple of people that are just absolutely beyond thrilled yeah, over that. We both know those people. <laughs> yeah, yes, we do. In fact, one of them was a guest on our show. One of them was a guest on our show. In fact, I heard from, I heard from uh, one of them uh, last night. Uh, and who couldn't believe it was going to happen? And I said, I think it's going to. And uh, sure enough, it did. I mean, there was every indication this morning uh, before the announcement was made. Uh, you know, it was it was it leaked out before the announcement. But um, yeah, absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. So I'm very glad for San Diego that they're finally going to get a show. It's about time. Yeah, well, I know I've said before that Paul, I think, is very much aware of playing areas that either he's never played before or hasn't played for a very long time, and and, uh, he addresses that. And even, like I've said, I'm so spoiled living in New York that he always plays in New York. And in this particular case, he didn't play in... He didn't play in New York City, he didn't play Madison Square Garden, he didn't play the stadium shows like City Field or Yankee Stadium, but he played close enough so that the people who would still go anyway would go to Albany. So that way he's also reaching out to people who are in that area or closer to Albany. So he does these things. And I'm sure that if he tours again next year in the U.S., he'll probably go back to playing in New York City somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all very cleverly done, you know, the way that he picks and chooses where he's going to play. And um, he's doing a great job, as, as are his people. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where he goes after, you know, if he goes anywhere in between the Candlestick Show and San Diego. Well, I'm wa- I'm waiting for him to to make up for the Japanese shows. Yeah, you know, I have a feeling that's not going to happen right away. I just get this feeling because he he made he uh, rescheduled all the American shows right away, but not the Japanese, and I'm sure people out there are wondering. You know, people in Japan and, and uh, South Korea. I keep, th- you know, I keep saying North Korea, but it's South Korea. <laughs> no, it's um, definitely are, South. Huh? <laughs> it's definitely South Korea. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, um, but people in, in the Far East have to be wondering what's going, whether their shows are going to be made up and when. And obviously, you know, nobody knows. But we'll see. I, I'm sure they're working on it. Okay. Anyway, so that puts a wrap on this show. 
And since this particular program is going to be posted fairly soon, I just want to give a little plug to something that I'm doing on my website. Occasionally I run something called a special contest where I give away a really nice prize. All the prizes really are nice anyway. But I'm giving away the dual format DVD and Blu-ray of A Hard Day's Night. I have a couple of copies to give away, courtesy of uh, Criterion. And from July 11th through July the 18th, within those eight days, I'm going to post two trivia questions concerning the film A Hard Day's Night. And if you get them both correct, you could win the dual format for A Hard Day's Night. So if you can, go to my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. It's right there on the home page. And then there's a link to my special contest page, which will have the two trivia questions posted one at a time. There you go. Anyway, okay. And um, I, uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can email me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. Ken, how can they get in touch with you? You can email me at everylittlething at att.net. And I have a Facebook page for Ken Michaels. We have our own Facebook page for things we said today. You have a Facebook page for your under your own name, right? Steve Marinucci. And we have our own email for the two of us, which is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. And I also have a a, new, a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary. If you care to join and talk about what's going on, uh, so. And that's when uh, the membership's getting up there, starting to get to get some big numbers there. So good. Good. Anyway. All right. So this has been wonderful talking about Paul's return to the United States for his first show here, the one in Albany. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. I'm Ken Michaels for things we said today. Thanking all of you for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for things we said today, saying. I want to see him too, and I will uh, soon, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>